Alright, so before we get started, I gotta clarify something. Some of you guys who have been subbed to the channel for a while might be scratching your heads going, wait, didn't you already do a Perfect Blue video? Yeah, I did. But, that was really early into all of this, so it has some issues, do put it lightly. Mainly that you can barely hear a word I'm saying. For the most part, I am going to be vague on spoilers, because while the film has been out for over 20 years, Still not the best at audio mixing, but there's very obviously a problem here. So I thought, why not? Let's remake the video for the Halloween season. Because I genuinely love this movie and am beyond excited to make up a new excuse to talk about it. Buckle your seatbelts, kids. Things are about to get wild. Perfect Blue, one of the most iconic films in anime or really Japanese media as a whole. So for those unaware, Perfect Blue is the 1997 psychological thriller directed by Satoshi Kon and adapted from the novel Perfect Blue Complete Metamorphosis by Yoshizaku Takuichi. Now, Satoshi Kon is a pretty famous name in anime. He has directed multiple films that have received acclaim, such as Millennium Actress, this film, Paprika, and Tokyo Godfathers, all major successes in the eyes of critics and fans. He also directed Paranoia Agent, a fantastic anime series that has also become a cult classic. Even if they didn't always make their money back, Satoshi Kon built up a sizable fanbase that was loyal to the day he died, sadly passing away in 2010 due to pancreatic cancer. He was in the middle of working on his next film, Dreaming Machine, which was cancelled following his death. The crew tried to finish the film using notes and tapes Satoshi Kon left behind, but struggled for years and decided to just shelve the project. However, scenes of the film would be shown in the French documentary about Satoshi Kon's life, Satoshi Kon La Machine à Revés. But even with his death, Satoshi Kon remains an influential figure in anime. Or really, just film at large. He was cited as a direct inspiration to Darren Aronofsky, who admits that Perfect Blue was a major influence on his work. And if you've seen Requiem for a Dream or Black Swan, that makes a lot of sense. Black Swan's basically an unofficial western adaptation of Perfect Blue. Now obviously it does its own thing, but there are some scenes that are downright shot for shot. Guillermo del Toro is also a big fan of Satoshi Kon's films, and quotes him as being one of the figures that proves animation can be more than just kids' movies, at least in regards to the West and more specifically the American market. Some even point out how similar Inception is to Paprika. I wouldn't go so far as to say plagiarism as some fans would, but you can definitely tell Christopher Nolan is at the very least aware of Paprika. I mean, the concept of people entering other people's dreams and implanting ideas or gathering information is a little too similar not to point out. Now, I'm a big fan of the guy's work, mainly just due to his attention to detail with his animation and his ability to juggle so many different tones and ideas between each project. If you ever watched a Satoshi Kon film, the first thing you would notice is how fluid every character moves. He worked very closely with Madhouse, which is one of the upper tier anime studios, and their collaboration led to some of the most abstract and creative uses of animation in film. Paprika is the gold standard that, if I'm going to be perfectly honest here, remains to be beat, and honestly is sort of Satoshi Kon's masterpiece in regards to just pure animation and creativity. It really can feel like just a complete fever dream. I don't even want to think about how much of a pain in the ass the parade scene must have been the animate. But fuck me if it's not worth it. Even his most grounded film still has some pretty stellar animation to it. Tokyo Godfathers, which is one of the most underrated Christmas movies out there, and really, I could see this being something the Coen brothers would have directed. It's fantastic, I love it. The guy had a lot of talent, and it's legitimately upsetting to know he died so early in the prime of his career. The guy was only 46. Who knows what he could still be coming up with if he were alive today. It's a legitimate loss to art, man, it ain't fair. But I mentioned that he's able to juggle multiple tones, and this is what I mean. Every Satoshi Kon film feels different from each other. Perfect Blue is a psychological thriller or horror movie, Millennium Actress is an abstract drama, Tokyo Godfathers is a comedy, and Paprika is a science fiction adventure movie. Paranoia Agent is a similar style thriller to something like Perfect Blue, but it leans harder into exploring themes of mass hysteria and the idea of a tulpa, and it's more of a crime thriller. 
Yeah, Tulpa is a fictional being willed into reality. I can't say any more without spoiling Paranoia Agent. Just sit down to watch it. It is a trip. But this video is about his directorial debut into film. Perfect Blue. I have to clarify that it's film because he's directed an anime OVA before getting the job. And you'll never guess for what. Yeah, the Part 3 OVA of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, the one that came out in 1993. Told you you wouldn't guess it. And honestly, that Part 3 OVA ain't bad. Just avoid the dub, it's not the best. An oil tanker for you. <clears throat> Oh, fuck! Also, it's a ways into part three, so you'd have to have a lot of context. But that's only if you aren't already a JoJo fan, which I highly doubt a lot of them would be looking up the OVA if you weren't, and it's, it's not the point. Now, I mentioned before that Perfect Blue, the film, is based off the novel, which I'm just going to shorten to Complete Metamorphosis to prevent confusion. Now, I haven't read the book, mainly because I can't find a copy anywhere, so I can't point out any differences between the film or the book. I'd love to sit down and read it, but it might be stuck in Japan. Of course I say that, but then I'm going to find a thousand and one torrents for it when this video comes out, but it is what it is. The day after recording audio, Loli found the Amazon listing for the novel. The point is that this video is 100% about the film, which is more than enough, honestly, because it has an identity all of its own. Before we get started, there is some stuff to clarify. For one, this is a very abstract film. It's not full-blown Hodorowski, but it's one of those movies that I highly recommend watching more than once. Even if you think you get it on the first viewing, a second one will really help. Now, to its credit, the actual plot of the movie is very simple. It follows a pop idol in Japan trying to shift her career into being an actress, and all the while is being stalked by a psychopath. But the way the story is told can leave a lot of viewers very confused. It's a schizophrenic movie, intentionally so. Satoshi Kon loved the idea of mixing fantasy and reality, of telling stories about showing how perception can warp the world around you. It's a major aspect of most of his work, and each one uses the idea in various ways. Perfect Blue has themes of mental illness and delusions. Millennium Actress is about legacy and how the passage of time can skew details. Paprika is literally all about dream logic. And Paranoia Agent is how society can take one story and essentially play a game of telephone, so by the end it's unrecognizable from its source. Now, these are the simple explanations behind each one. There are a ton of other themes you can pick up for basically every title. Perfect Blue alone has a lot of different interpretations. And it especially is beloved, as it's really the only film of Satoshi Khan that's explicitly horror. I wouldn't go so far as to say it's one of the scariest movies ever, mainly because it didn't get to me personally. However, this is very much an exorcist scenario. This is another movie I watched pretty late, in my early 20s to be exact, and was well aware of its legacy. But even when I sat down to watch it, and even if I wasn't scared, I was absolutely enthralled with this movie. There were multiple scenes that pulled me in so bad I legitimately forgot to breathe. It's something I truly feel is one of the greatest films ever made, let alone one of the best anime movies. It's just something you have to watch to understand. To put it in perspective, I watch through stuff I want to cover for videos, usually once or twice just to make sure it's fresh in my head, come time to write the script. For Perfect Blue, I've watched this movie three times in the span of two days. That is how much I love this. Sure, I could sit here and throw out the buzzwords, creeping dread, air of menace, high amount of tension, but it's something you won't understand unless you sit down and actually watch it. It just has a pull that makes even an ADHD-fueled zoomer put down their phone and stare straight at the screen. That's not to say we're not going to keep talking about the movie, you are not that lucky. You're probably listening to this video in your car, so you can't swap it off to a different video without getting into an accident. You're stuck in here. With me. Now, the main star of the film is Junko Iwao as Mima. She does a phenomenal job as this character, able to pull off a very sweet and innocent girl, someone who's just a good person that nobody has a bad word to say about, but when it comes time to scream or get intense, she really puts her heart and soul into it. The ending alone makes me wonder if Junko lost her voice screaming so much. <laughs> Other actors do a great job as well. Rika Matsumoto as Rumi plays a very down-to-earth counter to Mima, able to ground her eccentricity and feel like a natural friend to her. The cast is actually pretty small, and revealing the presence of some characters is major spoilers. Just know that there isn't a bad performance in the whole film. Some characters are scumbags you hate, or are the scariest motherfucker you never want to meet in real life. Plus, the music. The music in Perfect Blue is very interesting. It's composed by Masahiro Ikumi. Now, later on, Satoshi would collaborate with Susumu Hirazawa for pretty much all of his other projects, with the only exception being Tokyo Godfathers. And Hirazawa made some pretty phenomenal music for Satoshi Khan. Paprika has one of the best soundtracks in anime, hands down, but Masahiro's contribution to Perfect Blue is not to be slept on. The music in Perfect Blue is varied. You have unsettling chanting to traditional J-pop, to full-blown atmospheric industrial tracks that only exist to get under your skin. The track Virtual Mima is probably the most famous song. For good reason, it's easily the most bombastic and climactic song of the film. 
It plays during the more intense moments, with different parts of the song sampled for different scenes. It's one of those that will just get in your head and really rattle around. Plus, it's just a good fucking song. Another thing to mention is that this is a very dark film. It covers themes of mental illness, sexual violence, murder, obsession, stalking. It's the perfect movie to pull out at a family reunion and force grandma to watch. Crank the volume up as loud as you can during the ending, too. Make sure your young cousins can hear the fabric rip and Mima scream. It's art. It's okay. It's art. Yeah, this is a movie that doesn't hold back, and really, that's part of the reason I like it so much. It's just completely fearless in its exploration to the darker side of the entertainment industry. And I have no doubt, if the weirdos on Twitter found this movie, they'd be googling Satoshi Kon's address to send pipe bombs to him. They recently tried to say the guy who made Emergence belongs in prison, because how dare you use dark subject matter in a story all about dark subject matter. I don't know, these people are insane, and they'd probably have a stroke if they played something as safe as Yakuza 5. And honestly, they're the exact people that Perfect Blue are criticizing. Also, I really do need to put this up. Spoiler warnings for Perfect Blue. Please watch this movie before we get started. I'm gonna need to talk about full spoilers, characters, themes, and even my personal interpretation of what the film is talking about. You need the full context before we get started. This movie is only around 81 minutes, so it's not very long to sit down and get through. You will appreciate the advice. Now the film follows a young woman named Mima Kirigo, a small-time pop idol in Japan that is in the transition period to leave her idol group and pursue a career as an actress. Her first role is as a secondary character in a crime drama series. As she tries to prove herself in this new field, she discovers that she's being stalked by a psychotic fan that considers her leaving the idol world as a betrayal, and escalating violent incidents compound around Mima, only made worse as her mental state worsens, and she begins to wonder if she's the one responsible for them. I will repeat that this is the simple explanation of the movie, the literal one. It doesn't cover Mima losing touch with reality or her identity crisis. This is a film with multiple levels to it. You have the literal, the thematic, the subtextual, so on, so on. This movie says a lot, and there's a lot of different ways you could view the story. Some see Perfect Blue as a criticism of the idol industry and how it doesn't protect young men and women who essentially sell their souls to the devil for fortune and fame. Others see it as condemnation towards media as a whole, how it sensationalizes sex and violence without considering what that could do to the mental state of the people involved. There's obvious criticism towards fans and fandom culture, viewing them as obsessive, ungrateful assholes that will turn on you in a moment's notice for the slightest misgiving. The price of fame, as Mima's desperation to be taken seriously as an actress, damn near pushes her into complete insanity, and for something that she soon realizes wasn't really worth it. Mental illness is a massive part of the story. Some interpretations go with the idea that none of the film was real, and that Mima is just a woman suffering from delusions and possible schizophrenia something that is actually bolstered a bit by some elements in the movie, and this goes hand in hand with the ideas of existentialism and what actually makes something real or not. Your interpretation will depend on what elements stand out most to you personally, and that's what makes the movie so appealing, especially with how vague and abstract a lot of the scenes in the movie wind up being. You can have entire scenes that seem like they're giving you crucial information, only for the movie to say psych and reveal it was all fake. It's just a TV show. None of it's real. Only for them to readdress those elements that were brought up in the fake scenes. It keeps you on your toes. And it's why I suggest watching this movie more than once. So you can really iron out what was real and what was a trick, and even then, your answers will probably differ from other people who saw the movie. Now another aspect to bring up in the movie is the inclusion of the internet. This film came out in 1997. Technically 1998, but it was being shown in festivals the previous year, so I count it. So the internet was a very real thing, and a very new thing. Hell, there's outright a scene where Mima admits she has no idea what the internet is or how it works. The 90s included a lot of internet hysteria movies, most of which were schlocky crap that pushed the idea of red rooms or cursed websites. Sort of the ancient grandfather that would eventually spawn creepypastas and internet horror as an actual genre. Even Japan did this with Cairo, a film about ghosts using computers to manifest into the real world. It sounds ridiculous, but actually sit down to watch it. It's legitimately fantastic, and the movie is one of the better J-horror flicks out there. But Perfect Blue is actually really grounded in how it depicts the internet, even with how it ties into Mima's stalking and the later events of the film. The old internet was the Wild West. Anyone could make a website claiming to be anyone, and there were probably tons of fan websites for bands and singers. Oh, they're still being made to this very day. So when Mima stumbles into Mima's room, the fan site that follows her and reports on her routine, she understandably doesn't get how insidious it all really is. A big mystery of the film is who exactly created Mima's room, how it knows so much about Mima, 
and if it is tied to the violent incidents around her, starting off with threatening messages, to a letter bomb, and then just full-blown murder. There's even a strange irony that develops that Mima herself is obsessed with the website and checks it constantly. She becomes obsessed with the website that is obsessed with her. It essentially acts like a parasite, sucking away her sanity and causing her to doubt even her own identity. Is she Mima? Is the website the real her? What even is the real her? It's not supernatural or a literal evil website, it's just the product of someone deeply disturbed with very bad intentions. You could stumble into something like Mima's room in real life, a stalking site that is way too obsessed with a popular figure. It's actually a common myth that Perfect Blue is in some way inspired by the Bjork stalker incident, where a man who is extremely mentally ill became obsessed with the Icelandic pop singer Bjork and tried to mail a chemical bomb to her. I highly recommend the Count Dankula video dissecting the whole incident. He goes through the entire video diary leading up to the mailing of the bomb, and it's a genuinely haunting timeline where you watch this guy sink deeper and deeper into insanity. I can definitely see where someone would see connections to Perfect Blue, except the novel that was adapted into the movie, released in 1991, five whole years before the Bjork stalker incident. I mean, there is a possibility that the movie just decided to take influence on its own, but I don't know, I still haven't found anything conclusive about it. I just think it's a creepy coincidence that bolsters the message of the story, that there are fans who can take the parasocial relationship way too far. They lose touch with reality and begin to believe that they personally know the figure or that they can impact their life. Really, it's something that only ages better with time, especially with the age of social media taking off, where celebrities can be created overnight out of normal people just because they're popular online. Really, do I even need to mention VTubers? People who create characters to stream as and specifically appeal to and are inspired by? Japanese idol culture? Streaming already has its own issues with stalking and parasocial relationships, you know, throwing idol culture and that has potential to become a fucking shitstorm of insanity. Not even mentioning stuff like Discord, which are just the IRC chats of the modern era. Hell, it's common criticism towards Twitch streamers that they weaponize their audiences to attack people who ruin their lives, and just saying a little bit of a sniper wolf thing. Uh, this isn't to say that all of these things are bad or should be banned, that's not even what Perfect Blue is saying. The story simply points out that this does happen, and it can be very tragic and end up very, very badly. I hope you guys understand why I felt the need to remake this video. On top of the original review being super early, this is a movie that has only gotten more relevant. The modern internet has warped people's idea of what reality is and what human relationships are. Read some of the stories of OnlyFans sims dropping thousands of dollars on a model they like, and then watch Perfect Blue. You'll find quite a lot of me-manias in waiting. Even if the movie came out in the 90s, I would argue Perfect Blue has so much more to say now in the modern era than back when it came out. That's not to say that Perfect Blue is only good because of the social commentary. It's an interesting aspect, but there's a lot more to it than just that. It's just that, yeah, it can add to the creepy undertones of the film. That despite the dream logic, the story it's telling could actually happen. In fact, it did. Not word for word, but definitely had a similar tempo. And that's just one story of many. Hell, Perfect Blue isn't even the first movie to cover stalking and obsession. King of Comedy, the Martin Scorsese film from 1982, follows Robert De Niro's character, who's a mentally unstable man obsessed with Jerry Lewis. You also have The Fan, another film starring Robert De Niro, this time stalking Wesley Snipes. Homie, you good? Do you need to talk to somebody? Regardless, this is a phenomenon that's been documented countless times. This is the best kind of movie to watch if you have a fear of being watched or followed, because the entire film is filled with this tension, that something is wrong and Mima is in constant danger. Even from the opening, when you first spot the stalker, yeah, right from the get-go, you see how off he looks. Not just because he's ugly, but the way he's looking at Mima, holding his hand out so it looks like she's a doll in his palm. Mimania isn't in every scene, but his presence is all over the place. He's constantly doing things in the background, and you only realize this at the end when he finally reveals himself. His character is actually very simple, too. He's just a lonely shut-in that spends all of his time on his computer, chatting with who he thinks is Mima. He's completely obsessed with her, even getting a job as a security guard at one of her concerts just so he could look at her. He buys every magazine that features her, and when she is tricked into doing a nude photo shoot by a sleazy journalist, Mimania goes out of his way to buy every copy it's printed in as he can, so only he could have them. The film makes it clear that Mimania isn't actually in love with Mima, he's obsessed with the idea of her, the pure, cutesy pop star. He's never once actually tried to talk to her and couldn't even recognize that he was being catfished by the real culprit behind everything. He was manipulated because he was fed shallow platitudes, someone who just confirmed the preconception he had in his head about Mima. That's not to say he was completely innocent and just turned to evil. No, there are obvious warning signs that the guy was unstable even all the way in the first act, where it's established that one of the hecklers that tried to ruin a concert for Mima was hit by a truck and almost killed. 
said Heckler got into a fight with Mimania during the concert, and you see him leave the building just as Mima is entering, where she spots a torn out piece of newspaper talking about the attempted murder. He was trying to brag to her. We are never told whether the actual owner of Mima's room told him to do this or not. You could assume it as they command him to do other murders, but I personally think he did it of his own volition, and his already violent nature just made it easier for him to be pointed at specific targets. It's up to interpretation. Regardless, Mimania is a very interesting villain. He is shamelessly obsessed with Mima, not even trying to hide it. In a way, he's sort of a red herring. You're led to believe that he's actually the one who created Mima's room, since we see a scene of him on the website reading out messages that are actually in Mima's voice, so you assume that he's posing as Mima, and his obsession has gotten to the point that he wants to roleplay this woman he's stalking, but I say sort of because he absolutely does do some violent things. It's established that he kills certain characters, and even attempts to kill Mima towards the end of the film. Actually, he goes a step further than that, but yeah. Still, you only ever see Mimania as the primary antagonist, since the only other conflict is Mima's collapsing sanity. She's losing chunks of time and can't recall if certain things were dreams or actually happened to her. It gets to the point that she has to check Mima's room just to figure out what she actually did that day and what was in her head. It's a story about multiple people losing their minds who don't know everyone else is going insane, but we only ever see it from Mima's perspective. You get teases for Mimania in the scenes in his bedroom and one at a concert he attends, where he flat out hallucinates Mima, who acknowledges his existence and pays attention to him. There's even a creepy scene where every poster of her in his room starts talking to him all at once, every mouth moving, speaking simultaneously. Other than that, it's solely about Mima's descent into craziness. It could be a case where the book fleshes out more of the characters, but I haven't read it so I couldn't say. For all I know, the book is completely different. And honestly, it's for the best that they keep it to one character's point of view. If it tried to follow other characters and how they lose their minds as well, things could get very convoluted very quickly. Plus, it would take away the impact of the big twist at the end. And the character of Me Mania isn't really supposed to be a fleshed out guy with a backstory or anything like that. He's just supposed to represent fans who cross the line into full-blown obsession. He could be anyone. You see him do multiple jobs throughout the movie, making him a specific guy in the world goes against the paranoia of the story, how Mima can't really trust anyone around her. Now, I mentioned before that there was a real owner of Mima's room, that Mimania is a red herring that is just being manipulated to try to kill Mima, and that's correct. The twist at the end of the film is genuinely pretty clever. It comes out of fucking nowhere, but the lack of foreshadowing actually works in the favor of the twist. Remember, a big aspect of the story is Mima's paranoia. She doesn't know who is stalking her, and the whole ordeal is pushing her into mental instability. From the get-go, as soon as Mima wants to stop being an idol, she is stalked by a mysterious figure that escalates in their violent and vindictive behavior. The very first thing that happens to her is a phone call that interrupts a conversation Mima had with her mother. It's just someone breathing over the speaker while not saying anything. Mima innocently believes this was just a wrong number and hangs up. Not long after, she receives a fax that just reads traitor over and over again. The first big hint that this is an issue. Then you get the scene where it's revealed that the stalker snuck in a bomb through a fan letter that blows up in her manager's hand. He survives, but that's a rapid escalation in the tactics of the stalker. They even had a message tied to the bomb threatening that the next one will be real, implying they want to kill her. After this is when Mima is introduced to the website, Mima's Room. At first she thinks it's just a dedicated fan site, but seeing the very specific details posted about her life, her routine, and even photos that dip into private areas that a fan wouldn't have access to gets under her skin. She even finds out that they recorded audio of her rehearsing her lines for the drama she just got a role for, which she just did earlier that day. It's at this moment that we can assume that the person who sent the messages and the bomb is the creator of Mima's room, and they are able to get so close to Mima that they can record audio of her whispering to herself. The next incident happens after the infamous strip club scene, where Mima is talked into filming a rape scene as a dramatic twist for the crime drama, something that exploits her leaving the idol image behind to essentially dirty her up and market the sleaze factor. Her managers have a big fight over it, with Rumi, who essentially acts like a protective mother figure for Mima, demanding they remove it. While Totokoro, more of an apathetic professional type, is open to the idea, thinking it will give her a chance to show her chops as an actress. Mima agrees to the scene, though it winds up being far more intense and even she expected, causing the beginning of her existential crisis, now viewing herself as a tainted woman who could never be loved as an idol again, even hallucinating herself back in her old pop idol costume, mocking herself for ever wanting to leave being an idol in the first place. Not long after the scene, the scriptwriter who pitched the idea is stalked and murdered in a parking lot, stabbed to death in the elevator with his eyes removed, so it's gone from phone calls to a fax, to a bomb, to full-on killing a man who wronged Mima. 
since his attempt at shock value hurt her image. Despite the stalker wanting to punish Mima for her betrayal, they still have that warped affection that makes them gun after those they view as harming their obsession. We see this again later, after the photo shoot. It turns out the journalist taking the pictures is infamous for tricking young women into stripping naked for him, and Mima does exactly that, pressured by her label and the photographer to get naked for his perversion. This is another incident that hurts her image, as idol culture in Japan can be very focused on purity, so Mima choosing to go along with this is another nail in the coffin for her old life, and we do see that she feels dirty doing it. It was clearly something she felt exploited her, and only worsened her existential crisis. Well, that photographer is later brutally murdered in his home, and one of the more ambiguous scenes in the film. We never see who kills the screenwriter. The elevator just opens on the boombox and then cuts to his corpse, but the photographer is one that you clearly see die. He is stabbed to death with an ice pick, targeting his eye, his genitals, and then just stabbed at random in a fit of rage. During the murder, you never see who the killer is, as they disguise themselves as a pizza man to get access to his home. Up until you get this sequence, where they have the photographer on the floor, and the killer stabs them over and over and over again. It's Mima. You see her face clearly as the projector behind her shows hallucinatory images of her covered in blood. Now, the question is whether this is actually Mima or not, because it's actually not very clear despite the movie trying to trick you into thinking she's the killer. Remember, not everything in the film is literal. There's a lot that's symbolic or abstract, and this murder is one of them. Yes, Mima wanted to kill him. She felt like he took advantage of her for his sick pleasure, but there's a difference between wanting someone dead and actually doing it. After the murder, we see Mima wake up in her room, part of a larger sequence where Mima is unable to tell what was a dream and what was something she actually did or not. But she is convinced the murder was just a horrible nightmare until she checks her closet to find bloody clothes. You'd think that this is smoking gun evidence that she committed the killing. They even have a scene immediately after where Mima has to film a scene for the show where it's revealed her character is the murderer the entire time. Her character is suffering from dissociative identity disorder after being raped in a strip club and believes that she is actually her older sister who is a successful model. It really seems like it wants to push the idea that Mima is just a young woman who lost her mind, even having a fake-out scene where all the co-stars were actual detectives talking to Mima who just imagines herself as a pop idol. There's a lot of moments in the film that want to trick you into thinking Mima is insane. And if I'm going to be perfectly honest here, she kind of is. But I do use the word trick appropriately here, because they are tricks. You do find out what's going on, at least for the details that matter. It turns out that the one who's been stalking Mima the entire film is Rumi, her own manager. She completely lost her mind when Mima announced that she would leave being a pop idol to pursue an acting career. Consumed in full-blown delusional psychosis where she truly believes that she is the real Mima, a happy pop idol that loves to sing. Rumi is the true antagonist of the movie, manipulating Mimania to assist in her killings and being the owner of Mima's room. She had so many details because she worked right alongside Mima, and another creepy thing to think about? The audio of Mima rehearsing her lines was recorded because Rumi was sitting right next to her. She had a microphone on her to record Mima for her stalking website. Potentially, she could always have a microphone on her so she can record every single conversation she has with Mima. We never truly find out why Rumi went insane. Was it stress, mental illness she was already suffering with? Was she always obsessed with Mima and that's why she became her manager? There's never really a clear answer. And that's part of what makes the reveal so unsettling. Mima trusted Rumi. A lot. Essentially seeing her as like an older sister, and it's revealed that she's a psychopathic serial killer that wants to steal her life. You even discover that she kills Totokoro and Mimania in preparation for the final step in her plan, even going so far as to perfectly recreate Mima's bedroom to such a degree that she couldn't even recognize the difference when she woke up. Now, I say there's no foreshadowing to this, but there are some subtle hints. For one, after the letter bomb, you get the scene where Rumi is helping Mima set up the internet for her apartment after she's given the link to Mima's room by a fan. Right there, in this scene, we can see some elements of Rumi that point to her being the killer. She's aware of the internet, outright having to teach Mima how to use it, hinting the idea that she could possibly be the owner of the site. You also see a very casual and apathetic reaction to the bomb incident, Mima herself wondering if they should have called the police, but Rumi brushing her off and completely focusing on getting the internet ready, showing a very casual reaction to the attempted murder that could have been Mima. Hell, if you really want to get technical, even the crime drama itself was kind of a hint towards the twist, because the reveal at the end is the younger sister is actually the murderer. So, 
basically just flip the relationship. Instead of the younger sister, it's the older sister who turns out to be delusional and has disassociative identity disorder. The crime drama was outright telling you what was going on, you just confused the roles. The story is even able to cover its bases by having Rumi only ever seem caring for Mima, giving her advice and trying to shield her from the sleazier parts of the industry that want to chew her up and spit her out, even breaking down in tears during the strip club scene and having to leave the room during it. It's actually pretty genius, as the scene established that everyone involved was deeply uncomfortable. An actor playing one of the attackers even apologized to Mima for all of this. <laughs> so when Rumi breaks down and cries, you don't really see it as a weird reaction. She's seeing the girl she basically saw as a daughter or a little sister in a very harrowing situation. And everyone else isn't bothering to hide that they also don't feel right about this. Now, this scene in particular is interesting because of something they reveal about Rumi earlier in the film. She herself was a former idol that failed and drifted into being an agent for the talent, which is actually a pretty common story in entertainment, where people who can't make it as an actor become an acting teacher or a manager or something like that. But this puts a lot of Rumi's behavior in a new light if you took a step back and thought about it. She was already a veteran of the industry that Mima is still a novice to. They establish that while Mima is popular, she's only really been an idol for less than two years. She doesn't have experience in saying no or making demands herself, just going along with the whims of the directors and managers, hoping they have her best interest in mind. She's not completely wrong. Rumi and Totokoro do care about her, at least it looks like that. Totokoro in particular has a lot of guilt over getting Mima to do the scene. It's just that he sees that as an inevitable part of the industry he can't control, and the most he can do is get his client through it because the reward is that worthwhile. But knowing Rumi was an idol herself brings up interesting questions. Is she obsessed with keeping Mima as an idol because she herself saw what happened when one attempts a career switch? Was she possibly taken advantage of as well and left with a ruined career because of it? What if that club scene brought back unpleasant memories for her? Once again, it's open to interpretation. You can see Rumi as a tragic figure, someone who is broken by the entertainment industry and driven insane by it, or was she just always crazy and her obsession with Mima is due to jealousy? Rumi couldn't make it as an idol and sees Mima as an ungrateful traitor that threw away something that Rumi never had. We don't know. That's up to you. That's the magic of the movie. Every answer could be correct, and it trusts you to come up with your own interpretation. That's not to say it's some cheap, it's whatever you want it to be, wanna be art house shit. No, it intentionally leaves details open because the exacts of the nightmare are for you to piece together yourself. Whatever is the most unsettling or the most tragic. It even leaves intentional plot holes into the story just to make you feel that much more uncomfortable. You know something is wrong and anything could come up again. You're just waiting for something to spring back up. The movie is intentionally confusing. When it's revealed that Rumi is the killer, Mima still sees her as herself. Which raises the question of if Mima was seeing Rumi in costume around the city during some of her hallucinations. It's easy to put two and two together in regards to the second murder. Rumi killed him and put the bloody clothes in Mima's closet to frame her. But what about the concert that happened during the photo shoot? Was that Rumi on stage? People acknowledged that they saw Mima there, except she wasn't. Was it purely a dream? Did the idol company get a stand-in? Because then why didn't they ever mention that? It's a movie that doesn't operate on traditional logic. It can be very abstract and more about the experience of each scene. If you only care about logical consistency, you'll hate this movie. And then I'll hate you. And I'll probably bully you. Now this is where I plan on talking about my own personal interpretation of Perfect Blue. This is purely how I viewed the movie, and don't take this as gospel or what the canonical story is. Now if you watch it, you'll have your own conclusions. I still definitely believe that this movie is a condemnation on sexual exploitation, as there are multiple scenes directly punishing perverted behavior, or at the very least showing it in a very bad light. Like the screenwriter wanting to throw in a rape scene purely for ratings without any larger thought, or the photographer taking advantage of Mima. Both men brutally murdered. Rumi herself even refers to it as them being punished and both are partially responsible for Mima's descent into insanity. But all in all, personally, I think Perfect Blue is a coming-of-age story for Mima. When the film begins, she's very sweet and innocent, a young girl who had a successful career as a pop idol for a year or two. She enjoys shopping, feeding her fish, and hanging out with her idol friends. But a part of her resents how childish her pop idol image is, wanting to be taken seriously in the entertainment industry as an actress. Her crisis begins as part of her wants to go back, to retreat back into the safety of being an idol, as the adult world is dark and scary. The first role she gets is a serial killer that peels women's skin off. Right from the beginning of the movie, you see a contrast in how the worlds are portrayed. The idol stuff is very bright and colorful. They wear bright pink dresses, and there was a Super Sentai-type live performance before their concert begins. 
It's very clearly pointing out how immature this world is for Mima. She's basically a kid at heart. Her fans praise her every step, even Mii Mania is more passive and almost harmless, only picking a fight with a group of hecklers that were trying to sabotage her concert. She relies on Rumi and Totokoro as essentially guardian figures for her. They protect her, handle all the busy work, and give her advice when she's uncertain. But once she decides to become an actress, everything changes. Now, she's being stalked. People around her are getting hurt, and all of a sudden, she's expected to do these things that she really doesn't want to do. But she pushes forward, because she just assumes that's just what you do to become a successful actress, even trying to spin the strip club scene as some grand challenge she was proud to tackle, except she broke down in tears as soon as she got home. She's bottling up her fear and insecurity until it finally bursts out with the arrival of the real Mima, who acts as that voice in her head that is screaming for her to go back to her old life and only gets more aggressive with each incident, even telling her serves you right when she discovers the screenwriter was murdered, full-blown blaming her for his death, that if she just went back to being a pop idol, none of this would have happened. It's also why Rumi goes completely insane at the revelation that Mima wants to be an actress. She's basically the controlling mother figure, pathological relationship of the story. We don't see it until the twist, but Rumi essentially wanted to keep Mima under her control, keep her locked up in a gilded cage where Rumi could handle everything and hide her away from the scary parts of the world. And she views Mima as a traitor for bucking against this, even if it was completely unintentional. Mima wasn't actively rebelling, not at all. She wanted her to still be her manager as she shifted over into being an actress. It's just that Rumi is batshit insane and took this as personal offense. Such a minor thing caused her to snap and start thinking that she was the real Mima, because all Mima can do is sing and dance. That's all she wants to do. She doesn't want to be an actress. And Mima always does what she's told. You even see the part of her that wants to rebel and break out build throughout the movie. At first, she's unsure of who she really is and unable to really argue against the hallucination, and by the end declaring out loud that she is who she is and no one can change that. Even the subplot of her thinking she's a murderer leans into that sort of coming-of-age theme. At first, when she's talked into doing the strip club scene, she just sucks it up and goes along with it, just bursting into tears when finally alone and making an excuse that she only did it so she wouldn't be a bother to the people trying to help her. But come the photojournalist incident, she doesn't even try to justify it, just sinking into her bathtub and screaming. That childish idea that everyone is just trying to help is snuffed out. She's now well aware that some people in this field just want to take advantage of her. They don't care if her reputation's ruined, they got good ratings or got to exploit her body. So that bottle full of rage and doubt bursts out in the second murder scene. Yeah, it's most definitely Rumi who killed him, but Mima wanted to. She dreamed it because it's what she wanted to do in real life herself. Mima slowly accepts that she can also be outraged and angry, and that she needs to be careful not to just blindly take the advice of even people she trusted. Something that feeds into the ending with Rumi. Since while Tadakoro was truly trying to help Mima's career, he allowed his young client to be sexually exploited more than once. If he wasn't killed, I could definitely see Mima dropping him from her management just because she couldn't really trust him anymore, since he even got her a role in a film with what he described as some sketchy scenes. He didn't learn the lesson for himself and was about to put Mima in a situation she wasn't comfortable with for a third time, which is probably the direct motive for why Rumi snaps and murders him at the end of the film, along with Mimania. Once again, the pathological Rumi taking control of a situation Mima probably could have handled herself, and then pushing it to the utmost extreme, because Mima isn't allowed to make decisions for herself. You even see a progression of her fans throughout the movie. At first, you see a group of fans that are excited to see her new concert, talking about different shows they've seen and exchanging bootleg copies of concerts they recorded. They gush over Mima. Well, they actually show up multiple times. They're small recurring characters. You see them later when Mima gets a role in the crime drama, and they show disappointment in the show. They think it's boring and are pissed off that Mima has such a small role, since at first she was meant to be a cameo who shows up for a single scene and has one line. But as her role in the show grows, so does their annoyance. They go from gushing over Mima to going to the Cham concert that still has the two remaining members, gossiping how much better the other girls are, and only showing mild excitement at the rumor Mima would appear at the show. They are noticeably less enthusiastic, almost like they're trying to distance themselves from her. They even make dark jokes about how Mima's reputation is tainted, and that's basically death for an idol. It's an interesting progression, since it correlates with Mima's acting career and her insanity. She's becoming a more central figure to the crime show, getting more scenes and outright deemed the killer, but her old fans don't care. Even though idol culture is full of fans who would support her no matter what, they turned on her as soon as she stopped giving them what they wanted. Once again, much like Mimania, they didn't actually care about Mima. They cared about the idea of her as the marketable idol that isn't a real breathing person, showing how fickle even her old fans really were. To mature is to realize how little the rest of the world gives a shit about your problems. 
Mima has to figure out how to get out of the situation herself. No one's going to help her. They never even address the presence of the police, just vague references to them finding bodies, because Mima's arc isn't about her running to someone for help. You see this during the final act, when Mimania attempts to assault Mima. She screams out for help, but the studio's almost empty, no one can hear her. She's forced to defend herself with a hammer and knocks out Mimania. Using her own wits, she's able to overcome the attack and survive. When Romy finally attempts to murder Mima, there's a long chase sequence where they run through the streets of Tokyo. Despite a disheveled, bleeding woman being chased by an obvious attacker, running and screaming for help in public, no one helps her. The streets are empty and when she finally spots people, they just ignore her. Mima only gets out alive by tricking Romy into throwing herself onto a piece of broken glass, tossing her wig into the air and causing her to panic. Another situation, where Mima is able to outsmart her opponent and squeak out of a life-threatening situation. Rumi then stumbles onto the street, where she's almost hit by a truck, and while Mima could leave the woman to die, as she has every right to, she chooses to try and save Rumi, jumping into the street and pushing her out of the way of the truck. The two are wounded, but they both end up surviving. Rumi now institutionalized and fully consumed by the Mima personality, while Mima herself is able to move on and become a successful actress, completing her character arc and taking control of her life for good. Now, I think Mima choosing to spare Rumi is interesting. Yeah, Rumi is a psychopath, a full-blown sadistic serial killer that went out of her way to get rid of Mima. But to Mima, she was still her friend, the woman she knew for two years and helped her become an idol. So when push came to shove, she chose to save Rumi, even if it meant she might die herself. The first real sign of independence that proves Mima finally broke free. She's no longer under Rumi's control, and still had the humanity to help. She wasn't completely consumed by the despair and cynicism of the entertainment world, but she's much smarter and more mature than when she started. The journey is harrowing, but in the end, Mima became a much stronger person. And I think that is what motivated the end. Yeah, she will always hate Rumi deep down for what she did to her, but she has to respect on some level how much the whole ordeal taught her. No, her life as an actress won't be perfect. It's gonna have its own trials and painful moments. But now, she's able to stand on her own two feet and handle them. Sure of who she is, and proud to have finally moved on from her old life. This is just how I see the movie, though. Other people see it differently. Some view the ending as Mima just being consumed by the same system that will use her up and toss her out. Others think it's all a dream and Mima died in either of the truck accidents that happened earlier. It's up to you. But the coming-of-age liberation angle just speaks to me. It makes all the horrible shit Mima's put through mean something. Because she's a genuinely good person who really doesn't deserve any of this. And yet the world beats her down so much that it can feel like a bad joke at times. So the ending being more bittersweet and positive is how I like it. Because it means the death and horror can lead to something good. Even if it's not a happy ending. Regardless, this is all I can say about Perfect Blue. I love this movie like you wouldn't believe, if it's not obvious enough. Please sit down to give this a watch this Halloween season. Please. I can't promise that you'll love it, but this is something that anyone who claims to love anime or movies needs to sit down and watch. It's something I truly believe is a greatest of all time. Easily one of my top three movies, period, hands down. It's just so haunting with how it handles the story, the pacing can keep you on your toes and you never feel comfortable, the music is such an earworm that just stays in your head for weeks. I've seen this movie countless times, and I do not hesitate to try to recommend it to people. It's just an amazing film. If there are any flaws in it, it's that the abstract nature can be a little too convoluted to hide a plot that's really very simple. It's telling a story that takes about a paragraph to describe in the most out there way possible. Now, I don't think this is a problem. The entire reason you're watching Perfect Blue is because you want an abstract, disturbing fever dream of a movie, but other people will definitely flip a coin on it. You're either gonna love this or you're gonna hate this. There's zero in between. Still, at the very least, you should give this a watch. Check out Satoshi Kon's other stuff, too. It's fantastic. At the very least, be able to say that you've seen it. Until next time, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. See you guys. I wonder how many people are going to catch that I called the guy Yoshizaku when his name is Yoshikazu. Man, I love leading the, these little uh, issues in because it gets people to comment. It, it's, it's really good. Hey, loser. Do you want a shirt? Do you want a t-shirt? I have shirts now. Look in, look in the description for a link to a t-shirt you can buy. If you don't buy the t-shirt, I'll kill your family. If you don't buy the t-shirt, I'll poison your dog. If you don't buy the t-shirt, you're going to be the only person in town that does not have a t-shirt. Everyone's going to look at you funny. There's going to be social consequences to not having one of these t-shirts. I'm now making express threats of violence against you if you do not buy my t-shirt. I will call the police, tell them how they're not, you know, you're not buying my shirt. They're going to plant crack in your house, and they're going to arrest you and then beat you up in a jail cell. Buy my shirt.